Did you know that in the year ending March 2021, no suspect had been charged in 29% of all adult homicides in the UK? Wind the clock back to 1994, a year before the introduction of the National UK Database, and I'm confident that the percentage will have been higher. Ian O'Callaghan was a prime example of someone who exploited the lack of DNA knowledge in the early 1990s, and for a decade, he got away with murder. After brutally assaulting and murdering 66-year-old Shirley Leach in January 1994, Ian O'Callaghan went on to sexually assault a minor in late 2001, before finally being caught in 2006. Keep watching to hear the frightening story of a murderous sex offender who would stop at absolutely nothing to satisfy his twisted urges. You are now listening to British Brothers, the True Crime Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases and serial killers. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is the 10th and final episode of Season 6. We're in the market town of Bury this week, which is located in the northwest county of Greater Manchester. As of the 2011 census, the estimated population of Bury was 78,723. Let me quickly advise you that this podcast contains elements that may be alarming to some listeners, including murder, sexual assault, body mutilation, and the rape of a minor. As always, listener discretion is advised. Our villain this week is a man named Ian O'Callaghan, who is originally from the market town of Bury in Greater Manchester. Born in 1968, Ian, like many of the villains on British Murders, started his criminal career as a teenager. That being said, it may have started far earlier, we just perhaps don't know about it as the police were never involved. In 1984, when Ian was 16 years old, he decided to break into the house of a local 46-year-old woman in the neighbourhood. His original plan was apparently to burgle the house on Whitefield Road, that's near the River Irwell, however that all changed after he crept upstairs and found the unsuspecting woman asleep in bed. She was all alone in the house. Ian entered the bedroom and sexually assaulted the defenceless woman in her own bed. The police were informed shortly after the attack and Ian was subsequently charged with indecent assault. In 1992, Ian O'Callaghan was a soldier in the British Territorial Army, now known as the Army Reserve. In October that year, Ian was on tour with the TAs in the Lancashire city of Lancaster, also in northwest England. He reportedly stalked a woman as she walked around the city centre, waited for her to isolate herself, and out of nowhere, punched her in the face. As with the previous assault in 1984, Ian didn't get away with it. He was charged this time with common assault. Being arrested and charged was far from a deterrent for Ian O'Callaghan, and he decided to up the ante, as so many killers do, in early 1994. Before we get into the timeline of events, let me introduce a 66-year-old woman named Shirley Leach. In January 1994, Shirley lived in a house at Home Avenue in the Greater Manchester suburb of Brandles Home. It's just north of Bury. Her son, 42-year-old painter and decorator Gary Leach, was living with her. In October 1992, Shirley's husband and Gary's dad Ronald, known as Ronnie, passed away after a battle with cancer. The couple had another adult child who was a year older than Gary, she was called Beryl Linton. Beryl had a child of her own, a 19-year-old lad named Darren Linton, and he and Shirley were very close. Darren would later go on to describe his grandma as being his best friend. Her main interest was her family, but other things such as gardening and shopping with Beryl kept the widow busy. She was described as a supremely friendly lady who had time for everyone, she didn't have a bad word to say about anybody, and looked younger than her 66 years suggested. Shirley was also a keen music lover and would even educate her grandson on music. Health-wise, Shirley had asthma and her bladder wasn't the strongest. The latter of those two points we'll circle back to as the story progresses. On New Year's Eve 1993, Beryl was admitted to Fairfield General Hospital in Bury. I was unable to find out the reason for her admission, but what I do know is that Beryl was kept at the hospital as an inpatient 
which meant that Shirley took on the responsibility of being there for Darren in her daughter's absence. Every single night since Beryl was admitted, Shirley would leave home after her tea and catch a bus headed for Fairfield. For a week, the journey Shirley made was refreshingly uneventful. Having the buses running like clockwork is always ideal, especially during that weird crossover period between Christmas and New Year when public transport typically runs reduced services. That all changed on Thursday, January 6, 1994, and that's where this week's timeline begins. Shirley left her house that night at around 6pm and made her way to the nearest bus stop. The journey took just under an hour to get from the bus stop to Fairfield Hospital, meaning Shirley will have arrived to see her daughter at, what, 7pm let's say? Rough guess, but logical. According to the NHS's website, the evening visiting hours at Fairfield are usually between 6.30 and 8pm. I realise the events of this story took place 28 years ago, but perhaps those visiting hours were the same back then. If Shirley arrived at 7pm, it meant she had an hour to spend with her daughter and her grandson Darren, who'd also made the trip to visit his mum that evening. The two visitors left shortly after 8pm, again, makes our visiting hours theory add up, and popped into a nearby pub for a swift drink before making their way home. There's a few different drinking establishments on Rochdale Old Road, that's where the hospital is located, so they won't have wandered too far. They were passing time before the number 469 bus arrived. The Tottington Line service runs from the Berry district of Jericho to the town of Tottington, and one of the stops is Fairfield General. The bus arrived at 9pm, but because it wouldn't take Shirley directly to Brandle's home, she needed to get off at Berry Interchange, a transport hub, and board another bus to complete her journey. The journey from the hospital to the interchange takes about 10 minutes, and there's plenty of stops along the way. One of those stops was where Darren, who had boarded the 469 bus with his grandma, got off. The close pair had been chatting quite the thing along the way, and Darren recalled how they waved goodbye to each other before Shirley's bus continued on its journey and Darren made his way home. They had discussed a future shopping trip that both were looking forward to. Darren had no idea that that would be the last time he saw his beloved grandma alive. My research indicates that Shirley would typically make the entire journey home accompanied by someone, perhaps Gary, but for whatever reason on this night she was on her own for the first time. Worse still, Shirley was informed by two of the hospital staff who recognised that she had missed her connecting bus, the 474 service to Brandle's home, and would have to wait between 30 and 45 minutes for the next one. I'm not sure of the exact wait time, different sources quote different bus schedules. The last time Shirley was seen alive was by those two hospital workers who said she was walking across the interchange making her way, as far as they could tell, to the toilets. Remember earlier when I said Shirley had a weak bladder? Visiting the toilet regularly was the outcome of that condition. Shirley never made the next bus. Her body was found shortly after 4am the following morning by a couple wanting to use the only open ladies cubicle for some cottaging. Poor Shirley Leach had been attacked, sexually assaulted, murdered, mutilated, and left in a pile of her own blood with her clothes all over the floor. Her light blue anorak, purple jumper, black skirt and black shoes had been torn from her body during the attack. In one final act of brutality, Shirley's attacker had cut off her right breast, in an act which the police believed was indicative of her killer keeping a trophy as a morbid reminder of what he had done. The man responsible for the brutal murder was Ian O'Callaghan, but he would remain a free man for the next 12 years. Sticking with our timeline, the police were alerted of the incident by the courting couple and arrived at the interchange shortly after. The entire interchange was cordoned off for most of that Friday, something which no doubt caused massive disruption to the public transport users of Greater Manchester. Gary Leach, Shirley's son, had no idea what was going on until he was informed in person by the police later that day. When Shirley didn't come home on Thursday, Gary figured she'd just gone home with Darren and spent the night there. It makes sense based on how close they were, plus they would have been together, making them both safer. Shirley's body wasn't identified for 14 hours after being discovered, meaning Gary won't have been alerted to his mother's death until the early evening of Friday, January 7th, 24 hours or so after she left the house the previous night. The official cause of death, as confirmed by a post-mortem examination, was strangulation. The forensic pathologist also confirmed that Shirley's body had been mutilated posthumously. The weapon could not be identified. 
Detective Chief Superintendent Ian Maskery, the man leading the murder investigation, said, As regards the person responsible to attack whom I would no doubt express to be a defenceless old lady, we've got to be looking for someone who is quite brutal and who obviously has no regard for human life. How right he was. An incident room was set up with 40 officers answering several hundred lines of inquiry. Over 600 lines of inquiry were gathered in the first two weeks of the murder investigation. Some of the most crucial information came from three key witnesses who recalled seeing a man acting rather strangely at Berry Interchange on the night Shirley was last seen alive. The first, a man named Gary O'Neill, recalled spotting a man lurking outside the male toilets as he disembarked his bus at 9.05pm. Gary was making his way home from work at the time. The man, said to have been in his late 40s or early 50s, was wearing a flat cap, a grey or beige raincoat, and most tellingly, was sporting a green shoulder bag. As Gary was boarding his next bus, the stranger was stood facing the bus station on his own. The second witnesses were two sisters waiting for their next bus at the interchange, having spent the evening playing bingo. At 9.40pm, they happened to glance across to the women's toilets and noticed a man stood outside them for no obvious reason. The sisters weren't able to provide much of a description as the man's back was to them, but I think they did mention he was wearing a cap of some kind. The third key witness was a young girl who, at 10.10pm, 10, 10 spotted a man holding a blood-stained handkerchief to his face. He was walking across the interchange with a flat cap on. Again, he was estimated at being in his late 40s or early 50s. Those were three key sightings that the police used in relation to the inquiry, and it's something they emphasised when Shirley's case was reconstructed on BBC's Crime Watch. That was on April 14th, 1994 when it aired. It's worth stating that Ian O'Callaghan was only 25 when he killed Shirley, half the age of the stranger seen by the aforementioned witnesses. Perhaps who they saw was indeed Ian. Maybe he looked beyond his years. Realistically though, it probably was someone else. I can't say for sure either way. Another piece of witness testimony came from a group of teenagers who recalled hearing someone scream from the general direction of the toilets at 9.30pm on the evening of January 6th. That potentially gives us an indication as to when Shirley Leach was murdered by Ian O'Callaghan. Officers estimated that Shirley's body had been left in the toilet cubicle for roughly seven hours, and seeing as she was found at about 4.15am, that ties up with the estimated time of death being on or around 9.30. Police retraced Shirley's last known movements on January 13th, 1994, by boarding the 469 bus and getting off at Berry Interchange. Five weeks after her body was found, a huge breakthrough in the case was revealed. Whilst analysing blood samples taken from the crime scene, it was revealed that some of it did not belong to Shirley Leach. A sample taken from the toilet cubicle's door belonged to someone else. As well as giving the police something to work with, it also showed that Shirley valiantly put up a fight as best she could against her attacker, something that would ultimately lead to his capture. Perhaps the man seen at Berry Interchange with a blood-stained handkerchief was Ian O'Callaghan after all. Maybe Shirley gave him a nosebleed as she attempted to defend herself. We've discussed the UK's national DNA database plenty of times on British murders. It was introduced in 1995, a year after Shirley was murdered. The implications of that mean that the unidentified blood sample could not at the time be ran against a national database of offenders to see if a match could be found. It meant the police had to manually gather DNA samples from men and run them against the DNA recovered from the unknown blood sample. I imagine that was an extremely frustrating and laborious task. By February 1994, 500 men had been asked to provide a DNA sample to rule them out as a suspect. The men asked were reported to have been at Berry Interchange at some point during the evening of January 6th. That puts into context as to how busy the interchange is as a transport hub. The police were unable to match any of the DNA taken from the 500 men to the sample taken from the crime scene. Even after the introduction of the National DNA Database in 1995, a match could still not be found. Remember, back when Ian O'Callaghan was committing his crimes, it wasn't protocol to take a DNA sample when arrested. Therefore, he wasn't on file, and I can't see him giving the police his DNA voluntarily. In total, the police ruled out 800 men during their mass screening. Ian O'Callaghan was never considered as a suspect by the police. It's said that he did match the description provided by another witness 
who said she'd seen a man acting in a bizarre manner at Berry Interchange on the evening of January 6, but evidently nothing came of it. In June 1994, five months after being murdered, 66-year-old Shirley Leach was laid to rest at Berry Cemetery, just south of the city centre. She was buried next to her husband, Ronnie. The ceremony at All Saints Church was attended by around 100 mourners, with Reverend Ian Blair saying during the service, We are not here to remember a crime statistic or a murder victim, but a life. The life of Shirley Leach. The service reportedly ended with Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You playing on the speakers. It was one of Shirley's favourite songs. The investigation had been wound down by July 1994, leaving only six officers working on the case. They were being supplemented by four colleagues from the Serious Crime Squad. In September 1994, two officers made a trip to Germany to speak with a man who was in Bury at the time of Shirley's murder. They took DNA samples from him in the form of buckle swabs, but as with each of the samples taken previously, nothing came of it. So what was Ian O'Callaghan doing whilst the police were doing their best to find him without realising it was him they were trying to find? It probably won't surprise you to hear that he wasn't exactly keeping a low profile and staying out of trouble. In October 1994, Ian decided to expose himself out of his window to three girls who were walking past his home. The eldest of the three was 19, with the youngest of her two sisters accompanying her being 13. He was convicted of indecent exposure for that, however his DNA wasn't taken for all the reasons mentioned earlier. Also in 1994, the police handed Ian a caution after he attacked a woman in a pub in Bury. He knocked her unconscious with a punch. On January 6, 1995, a year to the day after Shirley's murder, police revisited the crime scene in the hope that Shirley's killer would return on the anniversary of his ferocious attack. No such luck. By 1996, the number of DNA samples gathered by the police had risen to over a thousand, but they were still unable to match the DNA from the blood found at the crime scene to anybody on the newly introduced National DNA Database. In January 1998, on the fourth anniversary of their mother's death, Shirley's son Gary and daughter Beryl were interviewed by regional daily newspaper The Lancashire Evening Telegraph. Gary revealed that he was having regular meetings with a counsellor due to the ongoing effects the death of his mum had had on his mental health. Beryl was also seeing a counsellor and suffering mentally, so much so that she had developed a stress-induced cancer of the mouth. Gary said to the newspaper, I've been suffering from depression for a long time now, so much so that I'm now undergoing counselling in hospital. Obviously, the past four years have been a very bad time for us both. From my point of view, it would have been better if my mother had died after an illness. At least I would have had the chance to say goodbye, rather than a policeman coming to my door and telling me she had been murdered. The siblings explain that they visit their mum's grave, and by proxy their father's on her birthday, on Mother's Day, and on several other family occasions throughout the year. Sadly, Beryl's cancer was terminal. She passed away from the disease in 1999, having never known who killed her mother. It was in that same year, 1999, that a £10,000 reward for information was offered by a British tabloid newspaper, The Sunday People. They had teamed up with former Greater Manchester Police Deputy Chief Constable John Stalker to do so. As well as the 40 to 50 year old man not being identified, another male was spotted on CCTV on the night of the murder. He had a full beard and was seen walking near Berry Interchange a short while before Shirley Leach was last seen. The officers had not made the information public knowledge until 2001, so as not to spook the individual, but nothing came of it regardless. They had circulated homeless shelters with the footage, which showed him in a Berry Town Centre shop, as the police believed he was a transient. In August 2001, the man was finally tracked down, but he was soon eliminated from the police's inquiries. A month later, in September 2001, Ian O'Callaghan exposed himself to another young girl. This time, the victim was just 11 years old. He just can't help himself, can he? That wasn't the end of it this time. A few days later, Ian spotted the same girl and forcefully dragged her into an alleyway where he proceeded to rape her. At the time, Ian was a bus driver and he was wearing his uniform throughout the duration of the attack. The young girl, who shall remain nameless, remembers how her attacker said to her, Let's see if you can keep this one secret. I'm going out on a limb here, but I assume the girl told someone about Ian exposing himself to her a few days earlier, and this was Ian's way of getting revenge. For the record, that is merely conjecture, 
albeit logical conjecture. The young girl would keep the attack a secret for 15 years. She courageously came forward in 2016, 10 years after Ian was finally arrested for murdering Shirley Leach. She would go on to explain what happened on the day she was attacked. This is tough to hear. Prepare yourselves. She said, He walked past me and I kind of did a sigh of relief because he didn't look at me. But he put both hands on my shoulder and dragged me into a back street. It was daylight but no one was around. He pushed me down onto the floor and I could feel his breath on the side of my face. He was in his work uniform which was dark blue and had a bag which he carried on the side. I didn't even try and move. I didn't know what to do. I just looked up at the sky and just turned away. I remember just staring at all the little lines of a gate so I didn't have to concentrate. I didn't tell anyone because I was too scared. He said he'd kill me and you could tell in his eyes he meant it. Later when we went on a trip to Ramsbottom and we were waiting for the bus, he was driving and I remember saying I didn't want to get on. I remember being so angry at my mum when she went over the road to speak to his girlfriend. When he raped me it was the beginning of September because I was due to start school. I told a few friends when I was 14 or 15 but I don't know if they believed me. I remember when I was walking to school after it happened, I was trying to keep up with all the other kids because I was scared of it happening again. Just put yourself in her shoes for a second. You're just about to go on a trip with your family, the bus pulls up at the stop, the doors open and you meet the eyes of the driver. It's the man who recently raped you. You're 11 years old. I can't imagine how scared she must have been. Do you remember that website called Friends Reunited? I know this seems like a bit of a tangent. It was basically Facebook before Facebook. But the girl who Ian had raped would go on to create a profile on Friends Reunited and it wasn't long before Ian's profile popped up on the recommended friends page. Imagine that. She sent him a message saying, I hate you for what you've done to me. We know that Ian O'Callaghan killed Shirley Leach and we know he was arrested for it in 2006. But how exactly did he come to the attention of the police? In February 2006, Ian was driving whilst intoxicated. He had been drinking. Ian was involved in a car crash in Moston, a suburb of Manchester, and he was arrested after presumably failing a breathalyzer test. You can probably guess what happened next. A DNA sample was taken from him, it was run against the National DNA Database, and it matched against the unknown blood sample from the toilet cubicle door where Shirley Leach was murdered. It took 12 years, but the police finally had Shirley's killer in custody. At the time of his arrest, Ian was married with one child and lived at Rugby Close in Brandle's home. It's only a couple of miles away from Bury Interchange. The house on Rugby Close was located just over half a mile away from Shirley's old house on Home Avenue too. Coincidence? Perhaps. Naturally, Ian denied murdering Shirley and made it unequivocally clear that he had no involvement with it. His denial was never going to get him far. The chances of the blood sample not being his were said to be a billion to one. It was also later revealed that the weapon used to mutilate Shirley's body was a broken glass bottle. At the time of Shirley's murder, Ian was working as a moulder at a road cone manufacturer and lived at New Catheton Street? Should have practiced that. New Catheton Street, a mile and a half away from Bury Interchange. He's staying local. Staying local, wherever he works, wherever he lives, is always local to that little hub of the interchange. After a three-day trial, the jury retired and returned within the space of a few hours. They found Ian O'Callaghan guilty of murdering Shirley Leach, and a truly bewildered Ian reportedly collapsed in the dock after hearing the verdict. Ian was handed a life sentence by Mr Justice Henrique, with a minimum term of 28 years. Mr Justice Henrique said, you attacked her in a most vicious and violent way. You had a propensity for violence and sexual misconduct towards women who were strangers to you, as your three previous convictions demonstrate. The victim was vulnerable. She had mental and physical suffering inflicted upon her before death. Being attacked in those circumstances must have been quite horrific. As I alluded to earlier, the young 11-year-old who Ian raped in September 2001 came forward in December 2016. She was shown a news article about Ian's arrest in 2006, but didn't feel like she was able to come forward until a decade had passed. Ian O'Callaghan was convicted of raping the young girl in September 2019 following a trial at Minshull Street Crown Court in Manchester. Judge John Potter handed him a 16-year sentence 
which will run alongside his 28-year sentence for the murder of Shirley Leach. John Potter said in his closing statement, You subjected a child to a violent rape inspired by your own appalling desires to abuse, demean and harm women to satisfy your wholly wicked and selfish desires. You have shown not a shred of remorse. It is conceivable that you may never be released from custody. And that was the story of British murderer and rapist Ian O'Callaghan. Let me know your thoughts about it in the YouTube comments or on social media. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or donate on a one-off basis via Buy Me A Coffee, you can find the links for each on my website. That's all from me. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.